and God we talked about in terms of science which always analyzes reduces things to other things God is supposed to be this whole thing whole enchilada how can we ever talk about God in scientific terms let alone try to find scientific evidence for God this is a very good question this evolutionary step is completely essential for even basic survivability of human beings on this planet. We have literally managed to train whole generation of kids on the idea that everything is material. If you hear the message of quantum physics, then all you have to do in order to see that there is evidence for God in the science that we are doing now is to recognize that, well, how is God related to consciousness? That's all you need to know. There is very definitive scientific evidence for the existence of God. And then my question to you. So what are you doing about it? Quantum physics. Quantum physics is the physics of possibilities. Quantum physics says that every object is not a determined thing, but consists of possibilities. Immediately we ask whose possibilities? Well, possibilities of consciousness. For what? Possibilities for consciousness to choose from. When consciousness is not choosing, quantum objects behave like waves of possibility. They spread like any other ordinary wave. But whenever consciousness looks, the waves collapse and become objects of conscious experience. Everything that you experience happens like this. Not only material objects, but thoughts. That too, meaning propagates like waves, and then we capture a particular meaning, and that one becomes an ambient thought at the moment. Same thing for feeling, same thing for even intuition. Those bodies that spiritual traditions propose, those bodies become our experiences as consciousness takes possibilities from each of those bodies and converts them into actual events. Radical thinking, radical thought, that consciousness is the ground of being, not matter. Consciousness is the ground of being, and matter consists of possibilities of consciousness. In other words, we are saying that consciousness is not made of brain, but brain is made of consciousness. If you make such a radical switch, then what happens? Then immediately you see that conscious choice is no longer a dualistic action of consciousness on matter. Dualism is not necessary anymore because consciousness is choosing only a possibility which is itself, its own possibility. No effort is needed. No action is needed. It's just choice. But be it as it may, as you switch from one meaning of the picture to the other, please ask yourself, am I doing anything to the picture? And the answer comes, no, of course not. I'm just choosing. I'm recognizing by shifting my head a little, shifting my context of looking a little. I'm just choosing by recognizing one facet vis-a-vis the other facet. See how simple it is? No dualism is involved because no doing is involved. No transfer of energy is involved. In this way, consciousness can choose out of material possibilities the actual event of experience without dualism to bother us. And a major problem of quantum physics is solved communicate non-locally 
proving that consciousness is indeed non-local. It's cosmic. Consciousness that chooses from quantum possibilities making an actual event, consciousness that creates this universe of manifestation is indeed non-local consciousness. Now you can call it God if you like. You don't have to. It's objective. It's objective and it's scientific. in such a way that the transformative power of quantum physics comes into our life. Non-locality of consciousness and discontinuity in creativity. This is quantum activism. We have to change in such a way that evolution is accelerated, not ignored. It is indeed very similar to what mystics tell us constantly. Start with yourself, only if you change, the world can change eventually. We are just taking it a little bit further. Not only you start with yourself, but you always remember others. In the olden days, we were satisfied by having a model of spirituality where I change and I eventually go to heaven and I don't care about you. This will not do because you are also me. You and I are connected. If you can't go, I can't go either. This concept has existed in some traditions. In Buddhism, indeed, there is a concept of bodhisattva where a being becomes so evolved in love that the being literally says that, okay, if you don't go to heaven, I won't go. I'll just stay at the doorway. But still, even that is not enough. This is why the phrase, what we talk, developed very welcome word, welcome phrase in our culture. So let's work our talk and make brain circuits of positive emotions. We just, we just do it, we practice. If some of us could be good, do good, practice do be to be do regularly, be with God some of the time, be in ego some of the time, and let the dance generate creative acts of transformation. That if we do just a certain threshold. I think very quickly we can achieve the power of downward causation in unprecedented numbers. A threshold that will carry us towards making that fundamental step that these changes will take hold in all of humanity, just not in a few of us. But the few of us will start this. I invite you to be a quantum activist with this resolution with this objective in mind. We can change ourselves and we can change the world simultaneously. Our consciousness itself seems to be made up out of quantized particles has been the subject of many mystical theories. And while the relation between quantum mechanics and consciousness is unlikely to be as magical as recent esoteric movies and literature claim, there is nevertheless a profound implication. As de Broglie's equations apply to all matter, we can fundamentally establish that C equals HF, where C stands for consciousness, H for the constant of Planck, and F for frequency. C is responsible for what we experience as the now, a quantized or minimum unit of an interaction. The sum of all moments C up till the current moment is what shapes our concept of life. This is not a philosophical or theoretical statement, but an inherent consequence of all matter and energy being quantized. The formula shows how life and death are abstract constructions of C. Another consequence of de Broglie's equations is that the rate at which matter or energy fluctuates and acts like a wave or a particle is relative to the frequency of the frame of reference. Increases in frequency due to velocity are relative to others and bring about phenomena such as time dilation. The underlying reason is the unaffected experience of time relative to the reference frame where space and time are properties of quanta, 
and not the other way around. Then, what is the will that sees, hears and perceives all other senses if it is not the brain? Who is it that sees, hears, touches and perceives the taste and smell? Who is this being that thinks, reasons, has feelings and moreover that says, I am me? One of the important thinkers of our age, Carl Prebram, also poses the same question. Since the Greeks, philosophers have been thinking about the ghost in the machine, the small man within the small man, etc. Where is I, the person who uses his brain? Who is it that realizes the act of knowing? As St. Francis of Assisi said, what we search for is the one that sees. In fact, this metaphysical being that uses the brain, that sees and feels, is the soul. What we call the material world is the aggregate of perceptions viewed and felt by this soul. Just as the bodies we possess and the material world we see in our dreams have no physical reality, the universe we occupy and the bodies we possess now also have no physical reality. The real absolute being is the soul. Matter consists merely of perceptions viewed by the soul. Yes, even if we start with the presupposition that matter is real, the laws of physics, chemistry and biology all lead us to the fact that matter consists of an illusion and to the inevitable actuality of a metaphysical matter. Amazingly, this phenomenon also occurs through closed circuit television. Um, various experiments have been done whereby people's skin uh, conductance is measured with electrodes on their fingers. This measures emotional arousal. And it turns out that there's a significant change in people's emotional arousal when they're being looked at through closed circuit television by someone on a monitor in a different room. This work's been replicated as well. Uh, one of the people who's done it, Marilyn Schlitz, is right here in the Bay Area. Indeed, she's right here in this room. Um, and um, so there's a, now a substantial body of work showing that people can tell when they're being looked at, even through closed circuit television. This is something which has become of great interest to the security agencies, and uh, I can't dis divulge exactly who or where, but I can tell you that the security forces are very interested in this question. Could a potential terrorist, for example, tell when they're being watched through closed circuit television? The answer to that is probably yes, if they've trained their sensitivity a bit. Um, this phenomenon is well known to security guards. Most security guards are well aware that if people are looked at from behind, they can tell when they're being looked at. Private detectives know that when they're shadowing people, when they're following them, they shouldn't stare at their back because the person's likely to turn around and catch their eye and blow their cover. Um, people in the martial arts know about this, and they, there are martial arts methods for training your sensitivity to feeling people's intentions or looks from behind. Um, and in the closed circuit television uh, industry, which now involves millions of CCTV cameras engaged in surveillance work, many operatives know that you can affect people by looking at them. I gave a talk about this in Washington, D.C. last year, and one of the guys in the audience told me afterwards that he was, in fact, a security guard. And um, when he was trained by an FBI trainer, uh, they told him, if you see someone doing something they shouldn't do, just stare at them hard on the screen, and they'll probably stop it have techniques for actually jettisoning the consciousness of the deceased out of out of the body and into a better realm for centuries when you think of a tree you tend to think of a distinctly defined object and on a certain level like the wave it is but when you look more closely at the tree you will see that ultimately it has no independent existence. When you contemplate it, you will find that it dissolves into an extremely subtle net of relationships that stretches across the universe. The rain that falls on its leaves, the wind that sways it, the soil that nourishes and sustains it, and all the seasons and the weather, the moonlight and the starlight and sunlight, all form 
part of this tree. As you begin to think about the tree more and more, you will discover that everything in the universe helps to make the tree what it is, and that it cannot in any moment be isolated from anything else. And that at every moment its nature is subtly changing, and this is what we mean when we say things are empty and they have no independent existence. Modern science speaks to us of an extraordinary range of interrelations. Ecologists know that a tree burning in the Amazon rainforest alters in some way the air breathed by the citizens of Paris. And that the trembling of the butterfly's wing in Yucatan affects the life of a fern in Hebrides. Biologists are beginning to uncover the fantastic and complex dance of genes that creates personality and identity, a dance that stretches far into the past and shows that each so-called identity is composed of a swirl of different influences. Physicists have introduced us to the world of quantum particles, a world astonishing like described by the Buddha in his image of the glittering net that unfolds across the universe. Just like the jewels in the net, all particles exist potentially as different combinations of other particles. So when we really look at ourselves then and the things around us, we took to be so solid, so stable and so lasting, we find that they have no more reality than a dream. Buddha said, Know all things to be like this, a mirage, a cloud castle, a dream, an apparition, without essence, but with the qualities that can be seen. 